ask him, do we still need to fast, you know, for the destruction of the temple and all these other things if the temple's being rebuilt? Things are going well for us now. Uh, do we still need to observe these fasts? And have you ever asked, like, a, I do this probably quite a bit, you know, when I teach uh, in school. Have you ever had someone ask you or you ask someone a question, you got a bigger answer than you wanted? Kind of, or you like, and I do that, like a student will come up and ask me something that's kind of tangentially related to what uh, they're asking. And I, I talk about something that, you know, it's a wider discussion that I want to have with them. They get a little bit more than they, they asked for. Uh, and that's what Zechariah did. He, uh, through the word of the Lord, the, this group had come and said, do we still need to observe these fasts that we've been doing on the fourth month, the sixth month, the seventh month, the tenth month? Is it really necessary to do that? And he gives them a, uh, a wider answer in chapter seven and says, it's really not about the fast. It's about whether or not you're going to repent and obey the Lord. So were you really fasting for the Lord or were you fasting for yourself? And then he reminds them of their past um, history, their past generations, and gives them a, a warning from the past saying, don't be like your fathers who made themselves uh, dull of hearing. They didn't want to hear the word of God. They made their hearts hard like a flint that uh, couldn't be uh, impacted by God's word and God's spirit. And they were, were hardened and God brought consequences on them and eventually kicked them out of the land. So learn from them and don't be like those previous generations. So he takes chapter 7 and tells them, okay, from the past, this is what you need to know for the present. So you learn something from the past. Chapter 8 does the same thing but the opposite. It takes from, here's what the future hope is going to be like, and here's the how you need to live in the present. So what you could do, if you're taking notes, is you could draw, uh, write negative warning from the past, is chapter 7, and that has an arrow to present behavior. And then on the other side, there's an arrow pointing back at present behavior, and then it says positive encouragement from the future, and that's Zechariah chapter 8 that we, we live out of both. We only exist in the present, but we learn things from the past. That impacts how we are right now. And we also take from hope in the future. And what Mr. Moore was talking about today is hugely important. Uh, the Bible is all about eschatology. It's all about future hope. Uh, it Think about how often in the New Testament, your Bible study, you read about hope in the future that you people operate from, even if they're not believers, some sort of view of what they want the future to be or hope the future or expect the future to be like. And so Zechariah tells them, he's not saying, okay, when is this going to happen? When are these things going to take place? He says, because these things are going to take place, here's how your behavior in the present should be. And that's what sanctification allows us to do. Sanctification takes from the hope of the future, brings it into the present, and we get to participate in that in advance. Um, in studying uh, in college and career group, we've gone through First and Second Thessalonians, very eschatological book. Then we've gone through Daniel, another eschatological book. In Sunday school, you know, we're going through Zechariah end times eschatological book. And I, what I've learned is that eschatology is more about, not the nearness in time, but because of the things, or since these things in the future are going to happen, it has implications for right now. So it's not, could the rapture happen today? Could it happen tomorrow? Sure, it could happen anytime. But the point of it is, our sanctification allows us to participate in the blessings of the kingdom of God before it even happens on earth. That's kind of what, what eschatology is about. So it has all those uh, different aspects that it brings into it. And I kind of compare it to uh, Christmas. Christmas is technically one day a year, right? December 25th. But we know that culturally for us and, you know, as Christians as well, that there's a Christmas season, right? That it really starts after Thanksgiving, kind of before Thanksgiving. You know what I mean, right? Where you start to, people start decorating, stores start changing. There's, 
what they're doing is they're taking from the future, they're knowing that Christmas is going to happen, and that's starting to come into the present. That's how eschatology is. Because the Lord's going to return, and these things that I'm going to read to you about in Zechariah chapter 8 are going to happen, that's going to cause us as believers to start to conform our behavior and our attitude and our hope to those things. So anyway, so that's something to think about, that what you look forward to determines present action, and then present action indicates, you know, what you anticipate. So, I mean, the very fact that we gather together and we think that's important, that's saying something to the rest of the world about what we do, even if they don't believe it. It means we're the eschatological people of God, and we're hoping in, uh, in the Lord. So it's something to think about, you know, what does the future look like? Why does it matter? So we're going to read about. And then what does Zechariah's audience need to look forward to in order to anticipate uh, the kingdom of God? What, what kind of hope did they need to take from the future? So first, I don't really have, uh, I have more points of an outline. They're not really, they're just as we walk through the chapter. But let's look at verses 1 through 3 and look at the the return and the dwelling of the Lord. That's going to be the main thing that they're hoping in, and then that's going to have other consequences. Read along with me in Zechariah 8, uh, 1 through 3. It says, Then the word of the Lord of hosts came, saying, notice, by the way, real quick, the word of the Lord is saying. This is a presence, not just a, a writing or a book. So when John talks about the word became flesh and dwelt among us, uh, he's referring to the word of the Lord who speaks and acts as God in Zechariah. It's a presence in the Old Testament uh, who shares nature with God. Anyway, the word of the Lord of hosts came saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Zion. Yes, with great wrath I am jealous for her. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth, and the, ho- and the mountain of the Lord will be called the holy mountain. Okay, so there we have the promise of the return of the Lord, his actual presence, and the dwelling of the Lord. He doesn't just come back once and, you know, and leave again. It's the return of the Lord and his continual, eternal dwelling presence Uh, with his people. And notice how many times throughout Zechariah 8, you can just think about this as we go through it, that how many times it talks about the word of the Lord, or this is the word of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of army. It talks, it reminds over and over and over again, this is God's word, tying that authority to it. So he keeps reminding them, this is not Zechariah's own thoughts, or he's not you know, sharing some feelings, you know, sitting backwards on like a chair and like, you know, having a rap session or whatever, you know, he's saying this is God's word about what's going to happen. God is really the primary speaker. Zechariah is secondary. And uh, so he promises this return back to the land. He uses two names. And this is a, this is a literal thing. This has not happened yet. There are some uh, Christian brothers and sisters of other traditions who love the Lord, love God's word, have a different perspective on these things, who would say, in a sense, this has been spiritually fulfilled, that Christ is reigning now, and that this is being unfolded on the earth through the church. Okay, We can see kind of where they're, uh, they have reasons for why they think what they think, I'll say that. However, you look at a text like Zechariah, and it's talking about this is really going to happen in a geographical time and place in real history, Uh, Not just in a spiritual way. But anyway, the Lord returns and he talks about, he repeats things. He says, I'm exceedingly jealous for Zion. Yes, with great wrath I am jealous for. This God's jealousy is zeal for his people that belong to him. This repeats Zechariah 1.14. So he's referring to things from previous visions in the book. And then he talks about, I will return to Zion, which is the, the mountain in Jerusalem. Zion has to do more with the, the theological name, more of the uh, messianic theology, the, what God's going to accomplish through Messiah and the blessings that he's going to bring. But he also refers to it as Jerusalem. That's the actual city, you know, it exists today, that, uh, that's the capital that's going to be the spiritual and political capital of the millennial earth in the kingdom of, of God. Uh, 
that it's going to have this focal point. Not everybody, not every human, not every Jew is going to live there, but it's going to be the main area where God's presence is uh, in a way visible and uh, there in a unique way with his people uh, through the Messiah. This is going to be the return of the Lord in the Messiah. And so he talks about he's not only going to return, he's going to again, like in the tabernacle, like in the temple, he's going to dwell with his people, right? So uh, think about John 1.14, where it talks about, John's talking about Jesus, the word became flesh and dwelt. That word dwelling is very important because it talks about God dwelling in the tabernacle, God's presence with his people, and then God dwelling in the temple, dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth or the Old Testament would say, full of loving kindness and truth. That's a uh, reference that always refers to uh, God. But this is God and the person of Christ. Uh, even John 1.14 talks about when it says the Word became flesh. Another way to read that is that the Word tabernacled among us, that God was dwelling uh, on earth through Christ. And, so, and then the next chapter, right, Jesus goes into the temple. See, that's a big, important event, is the presence of God enters the temple and they don't even they don't even know it right and jesus refers to his own body as the temple tear down this temple and in three days i'll rebuild it right so there's a lot going on that uh, it helps to know zechariah when jesus is in the temple because he's usually picking up on something from there but anyway he comes the return of the lord uh is going to be this dramatic event because Part of the judgment of God that's talked about in Ezekiel, Ezekiel's main point, this he's, he's before uh, Zechariah. He's before they're pushed out of the land, or he's right during the time that uh, Israel, Judah, is removed from the land by the Babylonians and 70 years of Babylonian captivity. And he's right before Daniel. Zechariah is several years afterward. And uh, Ezekiel is all about God's presence. And he's about God's presence in the temple and God's presence with his people and eventually the hope of God's presence filling the whole earth as a, a cosmic temple. And uh, one of the most dramatic parts of Ezekiel's visions and prophecies is that in Ezekiel 8 through 10, you have God's presence, his visible presence, getting up and leaving the temple and it's never come back. So it's, his presence has never visibly manifested itself in the temple again. And it leaves, and Ezekiel, let me read, uh, and you can turn with me if you want, Ezekiel 43, 1 through 5, he talks about the hope that uh, of God's return to the temple. And this would be in, uh, in the Messiah. This is also the uh, event that's, that's likely described in Isaiah 6 as well, and sees the glory of the Holy One that's on the throne. But listen to Ezekiel 43, uh, 1 through 5. It says, Then he led me to the gate, the gate facing toward the east, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming by the way of the east, and his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. So it kind of sounds like Isaiah 6, right? It says, And it was like the appearance of the vision which I saw when, I, when he came to destroy the city, and the visions... Uh, were like the vision I saw by the Hebar, and I fell on my face. That's in Ezekiel chapter 1, where he sees the presence, the image of God, uh, riding his chariot throne slash temple. And then verse 4, And the glory of the Lord came into the house, came into the temple, by the way of the gate facing east. So the glory of God, Ezekiel's looking forward to him returning to the temple and filling the temple again. Now the problem is, not really a problem, not a problem to God, but the problem is they've come back to the land, they're still under the political domination of those around them, they're still trying to rebuild in the midst of their enemies, they're not idolatrous, but they're really worldly during this time, and they don't have hope in the future, and they don't think God's going to accomplish his promises, and they know Ezekiel said that there's going to be this temple that's even greater than Solomon's temple, and then they rebuild the temple in Ezra, and it's too small. And people who live to see Solomon's temple, they're upset because they know this is not what God described in Ezekiel. 
and God's presence doesn't come back like it did at that time. So they know we're still in exile. There needs to be a new testament. So the Old Testament ends with uh, a cliffhanger. It ends with a need for another uh, addition, another expected scriptures to the story. So I even talk about uh, with friends who are Jewish, uh, they don't necessarily appreciate when I say the New Testament, you know, because they're like, no, it's the Hebrew Bible. But I'm like, there. but the New Testament is just another word for New Covenant, and you believe there's going to be a New Covenant. You may not believe, you know, the 27 books of the New Testament are the ones, but you do believe there's a coming New Covenant, New Testament. You're, you know, that's what everything the Old Testament is looking forward to. Um, obviously, I think it's, the, you know, it's in Christ, it's in Jesus, but... Uh, they don't believe that yet. So, uh, anyway, but that's, you know, so it is the New Testament. It's, it's looking forward to those things, and that's why there's a, a justification for why we have the scriptures that we do uh, in the New Testament. So God uh, is promised to come back and fill the temple with his glory again, but this hasn't happened yet in Zechariah's time. But he's telling them, he's coming back, and he will fill the temple, he will return, God himself is speaking, I will return to Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. He talks about it in chapter 5, and I'll be glory in their midst. And then they'll get kind of a renaming of the city. It'll get new uh, epithets, new names for the city. It says, then Jerusalem will be called City of Truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts will be called the Holy Mountain. So it gets a name for truth, it gets a name for the holy mountain. If you look at Isaiah chapter 2, it talks about the word of the Lord uh, will go out from Mount Zion and all the nations will stream to the mountain, which has the temple on it, uh, to, to learn from and receive the law of God uh, in, that, in that time period. So that's the hope is that the Lord's going to return, but then let's look at the results. What, what else is going to happen? Let's look at verses 4 through 6. Flip back to where I was. And what it describes uh, may not be that amazing to us. It's, it's pretty ordinary. But think of after like a disaster you think of even like right now, it's not a disaster in a sense, but like a hurricane or something. When you can imagine going back to life like it was normal, you know what I'm saying? Like after the coronavirus stuff or whatever, you know, they say now, well, it's never going to be normal again, but you know, who knows? Uh, but you could think of after like a hurricane or an earthquake or something like the idea of going back to when things were safe and normal and stable, what that would have been like. Uh, during this time, it was very unsafe. The people are living in the land. They're still having to trust in the protection of God, but they are surrounded by enemies. They are being harassed all the time as they're trying to build the temple. So they eventually just stop. And they're under the political domination and taxation and all of these other things from their, these surrounding groupings and governors and tribes and all sorts of things. Um, and they're not safe. And it's not safe to be outside. And it's not safe if you're vulnerable, if you're elderly, if you're very young. Um, you could even think about today, you know, being outside in the heat. That's going to put some pressures on people more so than other people, right? Uh, Josh Moore and I were talking about it. Josh is like, well, you know, it's hard. It, I can say I'm willing to do one thing, but it's as a 27-year-old healthy guy, that's not as big of a deal, you know, somebody who's uh, in their 80s or somebody who's won, like that, the heat's different, right? Uh, and you could think, imagine if we were out here trying to worship the Lord, we didn't have a building, and we're trying to build a building while people were threatening to attack us, rape us, kill us, steal from us. They may not even have to actually do anything. Just the idea that they might would, you know, be enough to uh, scare us, right? Well, listen to verses 4 through 6. The return of the Lord, what's that going to cause? Listen to verses 4 through 6, chapter 8. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Old men and old women will again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each man with his staff in his hand because of age. And the streets of the city will be filled with boys and girls playing in the street. 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, if it is too difficult in the sight of the remnant of this people in those days, will it also be too difficult in my sight, declares the Lord of hosts. Meaning, people are going, to, Jerusalem is going to be in such peace and safety under the protection of God uh, that there's going to be such a, a power there that protects people to the point where they feel safe with their most vulnerable populations playing outside. And uh, the curse will be reversed enough that uh, old people will be so old that they're still going outside, hanging out, and they're just hanging out there. They'll have their staff in their hand and just playing, you know, just enjoying being outside, you know? So, you know, I don't particularly identify with that, but, you know, some people like outside. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, <laughs> but if that's your thing, that's okay. Uh, and then little kids, like we had today, you know, people out, you know, kids out playing, kids play and they do stuff. And, uh, but you could imagine like, like August and Ezra out there playing and we all kind of keep our eye on them, make sure they don't go too far. But imagine just being like, all right, August, Ezra, they're like two, go play outside. We'll see you in an hour after we leave church, you know, type of thing. That's the type of safety that's going to be, uh, representative of what's going on in the kingdom of God. So it sounds kind of mundane. It sounds kind of ordinary. Uh, what, what I kind of thought about was the difference uh, between that there was a change that took place after the Reformation, even in art. Pre-Reformation art was, was medieval, and that's where you get most of our you know, famous uh, kind of, uh, in, not enlightenment, Renaissance paintings, you know, Da Vinci, those uh, Michelangelo, the Sistine Chapel, the Last Supper, very religious, very kind of uh, sacred art, and some of the best art that the Western world has ever produced, right? And, you know, the other Ninja Turtles, whatever they contributed, right? Uh, you know, what they added to that. But it's all kind of religious in tone. After the Reformation, one of the big things of the Reformation was that there's not this sharp, as sharp a divide uh, between the sacred and the secular. Meaning, you can honor God as a man sweeping the street, or as a mother, or, you know, as a pastor, uh, or a missionary, that it's not, that all of those things can be honoring and glorifying to God. So that even started to bleed into the art, and so in Dutch areas, and in, in Holland and other areas like that that were very affected by the Re Reformation and Calvinism, you started to get this change of art that was very simple. You'd have like milkmaids just doing their normal thing. And you had kind of mundane art. And that was, it was beautiful, but it was very kind of simple. And that's kind of the picture uh, here. It's just kids playing outside, old people playing outside. And that kind of was supposed to give people hope that this is what the kingdom of God's going to look like. So not to get too comfortable or comforted in their time, but to actually hope for uh, the kingdom of God. So like Mr. Moore mentioned this morning, like a time like this, yeah, we're having to suffer, but that just reminds us that we're not in the kingdom of God yet. Uh, but there, it's coming and we're going to participate uh, in this. We're going to see these things and uh, enjoy them. And we get to enjoy them in advance now as believers. Um, other people don't have that opportunity. And God even has to remind them. Re look at verse 6. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if it is too difficult in the sight of the remnant of, uh, of this people in those days, will it be too difficult in my sight, declares the Lord. Meaning this would have been something that seemed improbable, even impossible to the people of that time. Like, we're never going to have like that type of security and safety where the most vulnerable people can just be outside without worrying and without supervision. Uh, and so, but God is reminding them, it's not too difficult for me. So he's going to do something that was impossible. And in this time, how he demonstrated that was he was going to have them rebuild the temple. And so he said, look, I'll give you something in the near future to show you that the far future is actually going to take place. Um, let's look at verses 7 and 8, the return to Israel, the return of Israel uh, 
people to the land, the Jews to the land. Uh, Zechariah 8, 7, and 8 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I am going to save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. Literally from the land of the rising, where the sun comes up, to the land of the setting sun. And I will bring them back, and they will live in the midst of Jerusalem. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. And so that east and west is basically God's going to get regather his people from wherever, not just from Egypt, not just from Babylon, like last time, but from wherever they are on the face of the earth to come back and dwell in that land with him. He says, I'm going to save my people, I'm going to bring them back, and they are going to be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. So, this if you ask uh, Orthodox Jews today, you have to talk to Jews that actually believe the Bible, because a lot of Jews are, are Reformed and they're you know uh, pretty secular. But if you talk to Orthodox Jews today, Hasidic Jews, they'll say, one of the things they'll tell you is they're still in exile. And uh, what they're meaning is this event of the kingdom of God has not happened yet. And uh, therefore, we're still in exile too. That's what First Peter is about. It's how to live in exile until, uh, until these things happen. Now, we know they're going to happen because of Christ. Jesus has accomplished all of those things. We're just waiting for it to unfold. But the church is the uh, evidence that we're in the last days, that we're in the, that time period before the end, meaning not in tract of time, not in, okay, how many years is it until that happens, it means the next event is the day of the Lord. That's what's going to uh, be the next big thing on God's calendar that's going to take place. But God's going to bring them back to the land. This is something God promised all the way back in uh, several times in Deuteronomy, but mainly in Deuteronomy 30. He talks about He's going to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. He's going to return the people to the land. He's going to bring them back. Uh, and all those blessings are going to happen. They're going to be a blessing to the nations as well. And how is he going to do this? Deuteronomy 36, I will circumcise their heart. He'll, he says he's going to give them a new heart. That's going to drive the return back to the land. So there's a lot of uh, speculation. I, I don't... Uh, care for it because there's a lot of uh, well-meaning Christians in the past have thought they were seeing something eschatologically that that they were incorrect about I'll just say that okay so I don't like to uh, to guess about those things but you know a lot of times that's done even with the political state of Israel well until there's a repentance, that's driving people back to the land of Israel and they, they're turning to the Lord, uh, until that starts happening on a major scale, that's when you kind of can say, okay, this is something that's of biblical proportions that's actually being fulfilled. Um, so the political state of Israel as it stands today, maybe, who knows? That's, that's all I'll say on that. But it's uh, some people try to draw too hard a conclusion for that. And I think... Historically, if you do that, you step off of clearly what the Bible says and, and being conservative about that, uh, you usually end up disappointed or embarrassed in, in making those claims. But, but anyway, sometimes people, you know, want to draw a chart. Uh, Kenton brought me this thing once. It was a chart that uh, his mom had from years back in the 70s about how uh, the Soviet Union was going to be worked into the Antichrist plan you know, and then 1990, the Soviet Union's done, right? So it's well-meaning Christians trying to apply eschatology, but, but eschatology works this way from the future. It doesn't mean we say, okay, what's our chart going to be? It's, okay, well, how do we live in this time? Uh, so the people will be returned to the land, and God is going to be their God. That God-given heart will drive that return to the land, um, and that's going to lead to Gentile salvation as well, more Gentile salvation. Um, Kenton was like, we're going to have to listen to a lot of motorcycles going by today, but we haven't had to hurt through too many of them. Uh, there was this statement back when Britain was the, the main world empire, world power with all its colonies and all this stuff, that the sun never set on the British Empire, meaning wherever the sun went around the earth, that it was always on... Uh, somewhere that was uh, occupied by the British. 
Um, but biblically, when God does this, his kingdom, and Jesus' empire, the sun from east to west, literally from the rising to the setting sun, is all going to be under the dominion of Christ. Now, it is officially now, but in actuality, we don't see it happening yet. And uh, we're part of that equation as the church, but it hasn't, uh, hasn't unfolded, but it will. Um, there's plenty of evidence to show that scripturally as well. Let's look at the, the application. Okay, well, what, what do we do now knowing this truth? What did the people in their time uh, need to know so that they could uh, live during that time? Uh, let me read Zechariah 8, 9 through 13. It's, it repeats this phrase, same phrase twice. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong. You who are listening in these days to these words from the mouth of the prophets who spoke in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid to the end uh, that the temple might be built. For before those days was no wage for man or any wage for animal. And for him who went out or came in, there was no peace because of his enemies. And I set all men uh, one against another. But now I will not treat the remnant of this people as in the former days, declares the Lord. For there will be peace for the seed, the vine will yield its fruit, the land will yield its produce, and the heavens will give their due. And I will cause the remnant of this people to inherit these things. Verse 13. And it will come about that just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so I will save you so that you may become a blessing. Do not fear, let your hand be strong. So the kind of phrase that ties it all together, let your hand be strong. Hebrews 12 talks about this too. It talks about you do have weak hands and drooping knees. It's, it's to take strength from this knowledge to know that this is going to happen and let your hand be strong. Be encouraged, be strengthened, knowing that this future is guaranteed to take place. So it's not, well, because God is sovereign over the future, uh, I don't care and my actions don't matter. It's, it's no, because God is sovereign over the future, our actions actually can and do matter. If you have a world of uh, chance, your actions don't matter. One action will produce one thing one time and not a second time. It, it really wouldn't matter. Um, if you live in a world of, of hard uh, determinism, where we're just the facts of the universe, we, you know, there's no reason or rhyme to anything that we're doing, then the stuff just happens because it happens. Not because there's some sort of predetermined end and a sovereign God who's bringing it about. But when you have that, when you have that, the biblical worldview, the knowledge of that, that encourages us for how to live in the present. Hebrews 12, 12. This is the verse I was referring to. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. So it talks about this reversal of even the curse that's going to take place. There will be peace for the seed in the land. The vine will yield its fruit. The land will yield its produce. Heaven will give its due. And they'll, uh, the remnant is going to inherit all these things. And then the big thing, verse 13, and it will come about that just as you are a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so I will save you, that you will become a blessing. So God had cursed them. A curse is God's focus for judgment. God's focus on something for judgment, consequences, punishment. God's blessing is God's focus on someone or something for grace. So God says their original mandate or destiny of Israel was to be a blessing, right? The Abrahamic covenant was that God was going to bless Abraham, and in his seed, all the families of the earth were going to be blessed. How that was going to be worked out is they were supposed to be a kingdom of priests. They were supposed to uh, show God's wisdom in the law, their obedience to God, and they would receive blessing, and the nations were to look to them, and then the, they were supposed to redirect the nations to God to bring the nations into obedience to God, and that would have started to reverse the curse. Uh, that couldn't be done because sinners don't obey the law of God. So Israel was put in that position purposely by God to demonstrate that uh, if sinners keeping the law of God is the thing that will produce blessing, uh, that's never going to happen. But it's one of those puzzles because you have this promise to Abraham that's totally based on faith, and then you have the... Uh, what Moses is saying in his law as well is you're never going to be able to do it. 
uh, Deuteronomy 29. You know, it ends with this verse that people use as like a comforting mechanism. If you, if you knew it in context, it's a little bit different. You know, that the secret things belong to the Lord our God. Deuteronomy 29 is when Moses, in his preaching, puts together all the tensions and all the, the problems that people are going to wonder, well, how can these things all come together? What God has promised and the reality of our situation. What's, what's the link that puts them all together? And he says, secret things belong to the Lord. But then he answers it in the next chapter of Deuteronomy 30. But he told them, one of the puzzles that they have to, that Moses wants them to think about, is you're supposed to have a blessing that's been promised to you through the being the people of Abraham. But to do that and fulfill that, and to be a blessing to the nations, you have to obey the law of God. But you don't do that. So, instead of being a blessing, you're actually going to be a curse. And if you're a curse, that means the world is stuck in a curse too. So, we're stuck in this situation where there's supposed to be a blessing. Listen to Deuteronomy 29, uh, how God would even use that uh, curse of his people to uh, still speak truth about himself. Listen to Deuteronomy 29, 22. Now, the generation to come, your sons who rise up after you and the foreigner who comes from a distant land, when they see the plagues of the land and the diseases which, uh, with which the Lord has afflicted it, meaning the judgment on sin, will say all this, all its uh, land is brimstone and salt, a burning waste, unsown and unproductive, no grass grows in it, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and wrath. Meaning God's judged his own people just like he's judged Sodom and Gomorrah. How can that be? And it says all the nations will say, why has the Lord done thus to this land? Why this great outburst of anger? Then men will say, because they forsook the covenant of the Lord their God, the God of their fathers, which he made with them, and uh, he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Then they went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods which they had not known and had not allotted to them. Therefore the anger of the Lord burned against them to bring every curse upon it which is written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and fury and in great wrath and cast them into another land as it is to this day. So they've come back to the land. So how can they be a blessing if they're cursed? Well, God has to give them a new heart and he has to deal with their, uh, their curse under the law, which is what Christ did, that he redeemed us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse for us by hanging on a tree. So he took on that God-cursed death for his people, which leadership uh, could do if they were, if they were perfect. Uh, so, but that's one of those things that Moses ends the sermon, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. He's like, okay, see you next, you know, Sunday or whatever. And uh, he does answer in Deuteronomy 30, you know, verse 6. God has to give you a new heart in order to do that. Uh, but God promises them here, verse 16, that just as you were a curse, God is going to make you a blessing. So the nations are going to partake in that as well. Let's go to verses, uh, another application is not to fear, verses 14 through 17, as we finish up here. It says, for thus says uh, the Lord God of hosts, so notice how many times he repeats that, just as I purpose to do you harm, when your fathers provoke me to wrath, says the Lord of hosts, and I have not relented, so I uh, have again purposed in these days to do good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Do not fear. These, thing, uh, these are the things which you should do. See, here's some built-in application. Okay, here's how you should apply this. Speak the truth to one another. Judge with truth, meaning judge with impartiality according to God's character. And judgment for peace in your gate. Also, let none of you devise evil in your heart against another. And do not love perjury. For all these things are what I hate, declares the Lord. Then, I will stop there. So there's the application. Do, you know, Speak truth to one another. That should sound familiar. Do justice. Uh, love peace. Do, do, render just judgment. Uh, meaning impartial, biblical judgment. Uh, do judgment for peace. Meaning that settles the controversy. So these are things that by our behavior. So our behavior is more than just obeying God. It's, it demonstrates something about our hope in the future. 
So when we speak truth to one another, that demonstrates uh, our hope, our knowledge of who we are as God's people and our hope in the future. That should sound familiar because that's the logic of Paul. Remember Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4.25, Therefore laying aside falsehood, speak truth each one of you with his neighbor. Paul quotes Zechariah 8.16, For we are members of one another. Ephesians is about uh, the church of the Christ. It's the focus on the church of the Christ because of who Christ is, because of what Christ has accomplished, and because the church is in Christ and seated with him in heavenly places, that has major consequences for who we are. That the church is a new man in Christ. That the church uh, undoes distinctions between Jew and Gentile and all other sort of things that would divide people. And then Ephesians is about how to live a heavenly life because of that position in a hell-like world. And so, as the eschatological people of God who exist now, and as the new humanity of, in Christ, Paul is saying, okay, because of all that, you need to demonstrate that by speak truth to one another, each one of you with his neighbor. So lay aside the old man, the old Adam, falsehood, and instead be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that renewal that God does in the heart, and then speak truth, not just quit lying, but the Christian should be a truth teller, that we speak truth like we, uh, not just Mr. Moore when he preaches, he of course, you know, is kind of the leader in that, uh, as the preacher, but the Christian needs to be a truth speaker to one another, that we need to be communicating uh, biblical truth to one another. And Christian truth telling then takes on, you know, a larger significance. It's not just, we don't want to lie because that's bad, or not just, you know, and that's good, uh, we don't want to lie because it's against the character of God. That's good too. But it's also an eschatological act. We're showing that we're moving toward this event where God's coming. He's going to reign in truth and righteousness. He's going to make his city the city of truth. We should be a people of truth. And we demonstrate that by telling each other biblical truth, the truth about the gospel, repeating those things. So not just don't lie to each other. Don't do that either. But uh, but actually speaking truth to one another. So that's what Paul is picking up on. So he, you know, believes Zechariah was a, uh, a relevant book. He's saying, look, because these things are going to happen eschatologically, and because this is who you are, this is what you need to do. Speak truth to one another. And he talks about even in uh, Zechariah, not Zechariah, Ephesians 4.21, that that's because the truth is in Jesus. It's the definition of truth. As we finish up here, which is finished by reading uh, what we have left, verse 18 says, Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me and says, Thus says the Lord, he, now he finally answers after two chapters the question they had about fasting. So yeah, two chapters after the Lord's uh, given them a bigger answer than they asked for. Um, came to me saying, The fast of the fourth and the fifth and the seventh and the fast of the tenth month will become joy and gladness, cheerful feasts for the house of Judah. So, love truth and peace. So he's saying, look, eventually these fasts, when the kingdom of God comes, you won't need to fast anymore because they're going to become joyful feasts. That's going to be the, the situation. So look forward to that. Yeah, you can mourn over things and fast and fast because of repentance and all that's fine and lament over the sinful condition of the world if that makes you long for the kingdom of God, but also look forward to the joy and the hope of the future when you get real comfort, not the comfort offered by uh, the world. And so he, he finally answers, look, all these fasts eventually are going to become feasts. Remember what Jesus talks about in places like Matthew 9, you know, when they asked, uh, John's disciples asked, well, how come your disciples don't feast? He said, well, the, I'm the bridegroom. The bridegroom's with them. They don't, need to, they don't need to fast. But when the bridegroom's taken away, then his disciples will fast. So that, I think, demonstrates, again, we're, we're not in that kingdom of God yet. When Jesus was here, there was no need for his disciples to fast. They had joy because Jesus was with them. But when Jesus left, uh, you know, that temporary exit until he comes back, we're still in that time period of exile. We're st Jesus said they're going to fast after I leave, and fasting is one of those uh, key terms that you associate with being in exile. And so he answers that question uh, and tells them, okay, so what do you do? Love truth and love peace. 
Um, when we went through Thessalonians, uh, both books, talked about you know peace and different things, conflict with one another. But one of the things there that it emphasizes is one of the reasons to have peace with one another is we're demonstrating the peace that God's going to bring on the earth in the future. So it's important, not just that we get along, but that we pursue peace with each other because that demonstrates what God is going to make a reality on earth in his kingdom. So it has a, it's a big deal when people in church have conflict with one another in the body of Christ. That's why Paul picks up on it in places that it's like, well, did he have to really just call out two people like the Philippians? You know, there's one problem at the church is that two women aren't getting along. Well, he was making a larger point. Yeah, there's peace has, it's bigger than just the two uh, or more individuals that are directly involved with it because it speaks about God and what the church is. So anyway, um, and then he finishes with this promise that the Gentiles will turn to the Lord. Listen to this. Uh, Thus says the Lord of hosts, it will, be, uh, it will yet be that the peoples will come, even the ha inhabitants of many cities, and the inhabitants will go to one another, saying, Let us uh, go at once and entreat the favor of the Lord and, and seek the Lord of hosts. And say, I will also go. So many peoples, this refers to Gentiles, and mighty nations will come and seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days ten men from all the nations will get, grasp the garment of the Jew, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Meaning, when the Jews uh, nationally get converted and turn to Christ, they're going to be such a powerful missionary force that when Christ is reigning on the earth, people will still have to turn to the Lord and be saved. There will still be sin, but its effects will basically be reversed uh, during that kingdom period where Christ is reigning on the earth. Uh, nations are going to be begging to travel with the Jews to Jerusalem uh, to, to meet God, to see God, to, to know the Messiah. And the Jews are going to be that very powerful uh, missionary force. Right now, it's kind of reversed. Uh, Romans 11, as we I was flipped over and looked at it uh, today when we were Romans 13, when Mr. Moore was teaching, um, and was reading Romans 11, it talks about that the Gentiles have been brought in, that God, through setting aside Israel temporarily, has brought salvation to the Gentiles. And then how much, if that's great, how much greater is it going to be when they're restored? talking about it in uh, Romans 11, 12. So now it's kind of the opposite. The Gentiles have come in to kind of provoke the Jews to jealousy as the, you know, the Gentiles are receiving all the promises of God and the gospel and, and worshiping their Messiah um, until they turn to it. And then this is going to cause a, a worldwide thing. But we're already evidence of that. I've been saying this uh, recently, but it's something I've just uh, come to be thinking about is that for 2,000 years, billions of Gentiles have turned to uh, the God of Israel through the Jewish carpenter, Jesus, right? So they may think he's a false messiah. They may, you know, not believe in Jesus, all that stuff. But no other event like that has happened in history. Literally billions of people have turned to the God of Israel as the one true God through Jesus as the Messiah, and we worship him as uh, the image of the invisible God, like, that uh, should be pretty powerful evidence, and it is. But it also gives us a larger uh, mission as Gentiles, that that's, that's what we participate in. So even as we got here, to, you know, gathered here at church today as a largely Gentile congregation, uh, it indicates that an event like this, where the Gentiles are turning to the Lord, uh, it, it's going to happen, because God's already made uh, made something impossible happen for 2,000 years through the death and resurrection of Jesus. So anyway, let's uh, close in a word of prayer, and then we will hit the dusty trail. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Our God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the hope of the future. And we pray, Lord, just as we are prone uh, to forget that you would um, cause us to focus on the future and that uh, 
would have implications for our obedience now and our sanctification now. Lord, we pray that we would even take advantage of our opportunity for sanctification and holiness, um, knowing that that allows us to participate in what's going to happen in your future kingdom, Lord, that we get to enjoy those things in the present and uh, be a demonstration that those things will take place in the future. Lord, we pray that this day will be glorifying and honoring to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.